For the first few lectures, we've taken that the evolutionary process uh, for granted, that this is just how things are. And so let's stop for a moment and look at the actual evidence we have for evolution. We'll look at several different kinds of evidence. First is the fossil record. Secondly, comparative anatomy. Third, biogeography. Fourth, molecular genetics. The fossil record is something that we need to be able to calibrate to estimate the ages of specific specimens that have been obtained over the years. And so let's first start with how you estimate ages. How do you date the rocks? And the first of these is called a geochronology, so rocks and time course. How old absolutely are the specimens that we might have in our museums and our collections? In understanding this, let's do some basic physics here. Uh, let's first look at the term called isotopes. These you have atoms of the same element with different numbers of neutrons. And the first we're going to show here is carbon-12 versus carbon-14. Carbon-12 has six protons, six neutrons. Carbon-14 also has six protons, but it has an extra two neutrons, okay? Now, how do we look at these isotopes to estimate the ages of objects. Well, where does carbon-14 come from? It turns out that carbon-14 results from the collisions of energized neutrons with another element, nitrogen-14, in the upper atmosphere. And this produces a hydrogen atom and now carbon-14. So this is being generated in the higher atmosphere above Earth. Now, in the air we breathe, ca carbon-14 is always around, okay? And since it's being regenerated in the upper atmosphere, it's present in a more or less constant proportion in all living things. The carbon that we breathe in ultimately becomes carbohydrates, becomes part of our food, becomes part of our bodies. But carbon-14 is a radioisotope. It decays. And so after the organism dies, there's no more replenishment of carbon-14. What was available at death now decays back to nitrogen-14 at a steady rate. So the longer after death, the lower the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. So if we have a radioisotope that decays, it has a characteristic half-life. That means that after a certain amount of time, only half the isotope is still remaining. And after another half-life, another half, and so on. So where you are down on this curve can tell you pretty, pretty precisely how long ago the thing was actually alive. So carbon-14 has a relatively short half-life, and it decays from carbon-14 back to nitrogen-14 after only about 6,000 years. That half of it does, okay? Uranium U-235 has a half-life of nearly a billion years and decaying into lead-207. Potassium-40 decays into argon-40, again, at a rate of a half-life of about a billion years. U-238 to lead-206, four and a half billion years, and so on. So we've got some things that decay fairly rapidly, like carbon-14, and others that are much more stable, okay? But nevertheless, there's a characteristic curve and we can see the ratios of these things in the item and say roughly how long ago it was formed. So each isotope, given that short versus long half-life, is best for dating specific time periods. So if we're going to look at archaeological sites, we want to know when early man first came to Europe, if we look when people came across the Bering Straits from Asia to North America to become native Indians, then we'd use carbon-14. But if we want to get an estimation of when the dinosaurs were roaming, then we'd look at potassium argon, and there we can look at things that happened 240 to 65 million years ago. Now, a more recent technique in geochronology that's just been available in the last few years is called fission tracks. And this is kind of cool because you have a crystal of quartz that is formed with volcanic activity. And within the crystal, there are a few atoms of uranium-238, okay? 
And every now and then, one of the uranium-238 atoms decays, and this produces a blast of energy that go poo through the clear crystal, and it leaves a streak. And so you can see the visible trails, and this allows you to estimate the ages of quartz, anyway, back to four billion years. And then, at the other end of the spectrum, there's a technique called thermoluminescence, where certain minerals and ceramics, so teacups, are charged through the absorption of cosmic rays. As we're all sitting here today, we're being blasted by cosmic rays, and they simply just pass through us. But there are certain materials that absorb the energy of the cosmic rays, and it's sort of stored up kind of like a battery. And if you heat up the china cup, it will, if you do it properly, give off a certain amount of light. So the amount of light that's given off for the heat that you put into it will allow you to estimate the age of that teacup going back anywhere from just 10 years to 300,000 years. So the point is, there are a number of different techniques that can be used to, ep to estimate the absolute age of when a certain fossil may have formed, when an animal may have been born, and when it died, and then when an archaeological artifact may have been manufactured. The second way that we can estimate ages is rather than having an absolute measure based on these isotopes, is to have a relative measure of age. So chronological relationships. This happened before the other, so this must be older. So we've seen this a little bit in geology when we saw the term superposition, where you have the bedrock and then younger rocks are on top. So these always occur above the bedrock, so therefore these must be younger deposits. And this is in the way for a long time that people estimated the ages of the rocks in the Grand Canyon, for example, looking at its geology. So you have this deep canyon, it's a mile deep, it goes through lots of different rock strata. And there are some strata that are very, very, very old. They're down at the bottom, okay? So they're granites. So the Zoroaster granite, which is nearly two billion years of age. And then on top of that is a sandstone here, another kinds of sandstone. Here's a limestone, another kind of limestone. Here's a sandstone again, a shale, sandstone, limestone, etc. And each of these has a characteristic composition, the kind of sand, the chemical composition in the soil associated with the sand. And so these always occur in this sequence that the kaibab is younger and above the Torah weep, and these are all going to be above the bright angel. Okay? Now, here in this case, we actually have absolute ages that we can use the radioisotopes for, and we can give numbers, and this is, in fact, the kaibab is just five million years younger than the Torah weep. Okay? But the younger is always on top of the older. Now, We've also seen the idea of faunal succession briefly in, in the second lecture. Um, and we have certain index species that we know happened to be alive in the oceans or on land at a certain time in Earth's history. And they tell us, OK, if we find that fossil, any other fossil or any other material found with that must have been living around the same time. So here's a precise example looking at fairly recent fossils. And this is using a kind of warthog, um, and there have been a lineage, there has been a lineage of warthogs in Africa for the last few million years. And if we look at the molars of, this is its Linnaean binomial, an unpronounceable name there, but it's an ancestral warthog, those that lived three million years ago, their back tooth was relatively small. By two and a half million years, their back tooth was bigger. By around one and a half million years ago, it was longer. Okay? Now, in this part of Africa, there's a lot of volcanic activity. And so the, the volcanic ash and lava flows, those are freshly formed rocks. We can get good ages on those because of the, the isotopes that are present in that material. And so we have landmarks here from three million years ago, two and a half million years ago, 2.3, 1.8, etc. So we have an absolute geochronology, but we now also have a relative chronology. And should we find a fossil of another species amongst pig teeth that look like this, we'd say, oh, those only lived between two and a half and three million years ago. The fossils must have been around the same time. Okay.
So when do we get fossils and when do we not get fossils? Circumstances that favor fossils in the first place are rather special. You need rapid burial to get the material into the ground so it's not all chewed up by scavengers. And so volcanic ash, those are perfect examples of something that will bury animals. We saw this last time. This is Psittacorus, Psittacosaurus, uh, a very loving mother who's looking after her babies as they get cooked in the hot ash. Well, ash is great for burying things that might otherwise disappear entirely, like the leaf of a tree or a moth or a bee. So we get some wonderful fossils that have been quickly buried under volcanic ash. Amber is a great way that the sticky, um, the sticky sap of a tree, if an insect gets caught in that and struggles, it may get, then get engulfed. It's completely sealed off from the outer air. Nothing eats the sap. And so you have wonderfully preserved scorpions and small insects, even ants and spiders that are preserved perfectly inside the amber. And if there's a vast flood, there have been areas where catastrophic geological uprisings and events have caused lakes to suddenly overflow their banks or walls to collapse. Everything gets flooded. Everything underneath them gets fossilized, like these tree trunks. Living in an aquatic habitat is a great way to get things fossilized, especially if there's a lot of deposits of sand on top of, a, of the sea floor. So there's a lot of fish fossils that are out there from these kinds of marine habitats. And having hard body, uh, hard body parts obviously, obviously make it much less likely that the dead animal's um, remains will be destroyed completely. So there's lots of fossils of these things called trilobites. Uh, as we'll see later, they're related to crabs. He, these are ammonites. These are related to squids. They have a nice hard shell, and they're really well preserved. Also, these things lived in many parts of the world, in the oceans, and so we're very likely to find their fossils. Finally, there are some special circumstances where if there's a lot of organic material that's being deposited, like in bogs, that you can have so much organic material piling on top of the other that very exquisite leaf fossils are preserved. So individual fern leaves here. Uh, these are often in coal beds. And in these bogs, you may even find more recently remains of modern animals and people even that get mummified in the bogs. So these, under the right circumstances, can preserve a lot of organic matter and hence fossils. Now, we want to look at patterns in the fossil record to get a sense of evolutionary change. That's why we're so fascinated by the fossils. What does it tell us about history of life on Earth? And what we see over and over again, using geochronology to get a date, relative chronologies, however we do it, the oldest fossils are always very simple organisms. And the more complex taxa only occur recently. So the oldest fossils on Earth we have dating all the way back to 3.5 billion years ago. They're just bacteria. There are circumstances where individual bacteria can be preserved in the rocks, and we can see them in the fossils today. Even in northern Minnesota here, uh, on the Minnesota-Ontario border, there are some fantastic deposits of what are called stromatolites. These are colonies of bacteria. And individual bacteria may, may be seen. These are about 2 billion years old. And these are fantastic because not only are they records of 2 billion years ago, but we also know that the bacteria hasn't changed very much in all those billions of years because there are colonies of living stromatolites that still occur on the Australian coast. And so we have periodic fossils of bacteria throughout the entire history of the Earth. As we're going to see later, bacteria are fantastically important in our day-to-day -day lives. They're everywhere, and they've always been that way ever since life first originated. OK, if we have more complex organisms, let's get to, say, vertebrates of some sort, or insects, or what have you, the oldest fossils are much more different from living species. So oldest fossils are the most different from living forms. This is a nice example here of the horses, where we've had fossil horses uh, in the geological record going back 60 million years. And these early fossils are quite different from the lineage that, as it moved along, the animals changed. 
and we have the modern horse by about three million years ago. Now, the U.S. Postal Service has commemorated in this lovely stamp the earliest fossil horse called Eohippus, and the key thing they've got here in their, their rendering is it's got three toes. So we have a three-toed horse. These early horses had multiple toes, and they were also very small. They're only the size of a cat. So these cat-like animals with three toes eventually evolved up to a one-toed form up here, and they're much bigger. So the further back we go in the evolutionary history, the more different they are from the modern form. Elephants, likewise, there's been quite a stunning change in the lineage of, from the earliest elephants to modern elephants, the biggest land mammal today with trunks and big tusks. The earliest didn't have tusks at all. They probably had something beginning like a trunk, but again, they're quite small in comparison to a modern horse. And as this lineage evolved, there's a proliferation of forms, some with quite extravagant tusks that are on their lower jaw rather than on the top, some that crisscrossed, and then finally we just have the two modern forms. So if we look at this, we can also see, of course, by interpolation, looking at things that are closer in time, that those that are chronologically adjacent, those that are similar in time, they show the greatest physical similarities. To look at this point, uh, we won't use the fossil record, we'll look at a modern phylogeny or evolutionary tree of the flies. So these are all the living forms of flies, and there's two groups we just want to look at briefly here, the house flies, which are down here, and the mosquitoes. Now, the branch that led off to the mosquitoes split off from that that led to the flies quite some time ago, and no one would mistake a house fly for a mosquitoes. But amongst the mosquitoes, there's a diversity of forms that are all really quite similar to each other. All of these different mosquitoes are much more similar. They diverge from each other much more recently. So with less time, they haven't developed the kind of extreme changes in body plan that we see after much longer period that you would get, like differentiating between flies and mosquitoes. So to summarize all this, the fossil record clearly reveals the great age of life on Earth, going back billions of years. And every lineage we look at shows a persistent pattern of change. This is true among all living things.